record on the computer. And I'm going to go to Facebook. I send it out everywhere nowadays. I'm not that great yet at social media, but I put it out to TikTok and Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and also to threads. So I'm getting there and on my YouTube. Yeah, I'm just simple with the technology. Like I don't have a whole lot of knowledge for it, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm just trying to get it promoted and so people get views. Mm -hmm. But okay. I'm typing and I'll be right with you. Okay. I put something in the chat for you to put it in your social medias. Nice. If you would do that for me, that would be great. Absolutely. <laughs> Anything to promote this. Thank you. And you can do the hashtags or at signs, whatever. And uh, tell me when you're ready and I'll hit go live. I am ready. Super duper man. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. It's your girl. Oh, Linda Marcus. <laughs> I am here with the amazing host, creator, everything for Splat from the Past podcast show. He interviews huge celebrities. Follow him. His Instagram and all those things are in the chat right here. So go over there and follow him. Let me read you the introduction I have from him. It says exactly this. Tommy throwback Kovac, Tommy throwback Kovac, right? Mm -hmm. I got the Kovac right. Tommy throwback Kovac. Tommy throwback Kovac, pop culture nerd, podcaster, sometimes comedian, belly button enthusiast. We don't know if it's an any or an Audi that he prefers, but let's get right to it right now. Welcome my one and only guest of the day, Tommy Throwback Kovac. I'm back. Hey, Linda. <laughs> Hi, Tommy. What's up? Nothing's too much. Um, you know, last month was a pretty interesting month. I had COVID uh, for, you know, 12 days or whatever, but I'm feeling better now. But I had such low energy. I was just like, oh, God. You know, and I've had some pretty bad colds in my life, but that was just the most horrendous, horrendous. Yeah. There's nothing Avoided worse, at all costs. Nothing worse than not feeling up to par. Yeah. <laughs> It was just, you know, it was a domino effect. You know, we had a 4th of July party. My brother got it. And then um, my mom got it. And finally me. I don't know how my nephew didn't get it. But, um, yeah, it was a domino effect, sadly. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm glad you're back. Back stronger than ever? Yep, stronger than ever. The All bull. Right. <laughs> well, I've had you on before, but this one is going to be special because I'm going to shut my pie hole and I'm going to listen to you most of the time. And I want you to brag it up. I want you to talk about all of your great guests, the ones that are oh, yeah. hugely mm -hmm. famous, some of the highs and low moments, crazy. You can cover the um, the Judy Carter weird, hard, stupid, scary Go for it, Tommy. Fill us in. You're gonna get very little interruption from me. Yeah, yeah, I've always wanted to I've always wanted to interview Judy Carter, but I've never been able to make the connection. I admire her greatly. No, but uh, yeah, last week uh, when we were going to do this originally, I told you I wanted to talk about the death of uh, Mitzi McCall because I interviewed her and her husband Charlie a couple of years ago. Yeah, that was interesting. So, like um, at the end of 2021. Uh, Mark Marin interviewed the Smothers Brothers, and I was so jealous. I was like, oh, my God, I would love to interview an old comedy team that was around, oh, my God, in the late 50s, early 60s, and just find out all these great stories. I had interviewed John Biner before, and he had a book out, and he didn't want to rehash stuff, but, like, I just wanted the, a, a comedy team. 
and then around that time, it gets advertised that uh, Mitzi and Charlie are booked for the Hollywood show, which is an autograph show in Burbank where they have, oh my God, hundreds of, of celebrities there signing every three months over there. And I was like, I thought they're, I thought they were past. I didn't know they were still alive. I was like, that is awesome. And then it turns out Charlie's on Facebook. So I sent him a DM. Um, I guess it went to a spam folder. I never heard back. And he had, he announced that Mitzi had COVID and um, they were most likely going to cancel their appearance there or something like that. So um, finally, around March, I um, find um, uh, Charlie's uh, daughter, Jenny, on, on Facebook. And she didn't know me from Adam. And I sent her a message and she's like, absolutely, I'll connect you with them. And she did. And um, I got Charlie's email and uh, he gives me his number. I call him up and we have a, a, a nice talk. And then he tells me to call him back in a few days to check with um, their schedule and everything. So I do that. And Mitzi picks up the phone and she yells at me. She's like, so like, how did you get this number? You know, and, just, and all this stuff. It was it was pretty funny and stuff. And, it, you know, she gave uh, the phone to Charlie and then we uh, scheduled it. And then uh, the day that we actually do it, um, I got the two of them and I'm just nervous. I'm a bundle of nerves. Thank God they were funny and they were doing their husband and wife routine because if it wasn't for that, I don't know what I would have done. And they were just so hilariously funny. You know, she's calling him a putz every few minutes, you know, and, and all of that. <laughs> and two two things that that particularly stand out from that interview and by the way that's on my list of favorites um charlie went to school with elliot gould and david carradine and i said to them did you know then that they would you know become these kind of iconic stars and charlie said no i i was going to be the star they were uh, they were a couple of schmucks or <laughs> something <like that. laughs> and elliot gould's his best friend too that's his best friend they're like in the same uh graduating class wow. and Carradine was like a year older or something yeah and then Mitzi tells um the story about uh backstage at the Ed Sullivan show before um the Beatles went on they were at the Coca-Cola machine <laughs> and John Lennon obviously saw them at the Coca-Cola machine and a few moments later he's knocking on their dressing room door and he says, excuse me, I need a Coke for Ringo. <laughs> now, they didn't know who Ringo was yet. They didn't know the names of any of these guys yet. You know, <laughs> all they knew was that all the kids were going crazy for these guys from England. That's all they knew. Right. So Mitzi said, a Coke for Ringo. What's that? A Jewish holiday we don't know about? <laughs> <laughs> love that story. <laughs> I love that story. And then... For the ninth day of Hanukkah. <laughs> exactly, you know, um, or Rakaporum or whatever that holiday is called. Um, uh, Yom Kippurim, what, uh, yeah, Yom Kippurim, that's what it was. So then um, after, after the interview is over, Mitzi calls me back and she tells me that that I, I'm good at what I do and that they had a blast and that if I'm ever in L.A. that, you know, I should come over and she'll make me Jewish food and all of that stuff. You know, it, it never happened, unfortunately. But I went back and listened to the interview that night and I just got this tear and this chill simultaneously when, when Mitzi said to me, bye, Tommy, and then hung up. That was just so emotional for me. Wow. How long before, when was the interview and when did she pass? It was March of 2022 and she passed last week. Um, I believe it was last Thursday or Friday of last week, something like that. Yeah. What a bummer. What a bummer. Well, that's great that you got to interview them and that she called you back though. What a special, special memory. A couple people have, have done that. Marion Ross from Happy Days did that to me. Um, I only had 30 minutes with her. We we had a, a great talk and we covered a lot of the stuff I wanted to. And she what did she talk forthcoming. about? Oh, we talked about Happy Days. We talked about she was a contract player at Paramount like in the 1950s. Um, 
uh, stuff like that. You know, she she has done so much episodic television outside of Happy Days. Like, it, like you know, I didn't want to dwell on it too much because it was just probably an in and out gig or something because she's done so much. But she has a lot of nice things to say about a lot of people that she's worked with. So, Great. you know, we we did that, you know, and then she called me back two hours later and told me I was a gentleman and that she had a blast. And that was a special. Oh, really special. wow. Tell me some other people that have recognized your talent and appreciated you. <clears throat> well, every guest I've had come on multiple times, obviously, you know, there's a lot of people who've been with me since the beginning that I still have on yearly and stuff. And we have pretty colorful conversations, both on record and off record. A lot of the cult movie actors in the eighties and stuff, uh, Catherine Mary Stewart, uh, this one uh, woman, uh, Marie Lauren, who uh, me and my mom got to have um, lunch with her uh, or breakfast with her when we were out in L.A. in 2019. Um, lots of lots of people, Kathleen Kinmont, uh, a, a lot of people to come on, you know, yearly and stuff. Uh, I got to tell you about my my Burt Ward interview. I interviewed Burt Ward, who played Robin on Batman. That was during the pandemic. And I've been trying to make the connection for a long time. And finally, I got the connection through uh, his wife, and she gave me the publicist's name. And so um, I emailed him, got it all set up. Now, the day of, it was a Wednesday. And I call him. I called him like six times, and he didn't answer. And then when he did answer, I told him, you know, we're, we're scheduled to do the interview. He yelled at the top of his lungs, not at me, but the publicist, because he has done this before. He told me he can't do interviews on Wednesday. And he told me the reason why, which I won't repeat because I want to honor his privacy. It was really, really sad why he can't do it. And it touched me. So he said, you know, let's let, can you do it tomorrow? And I said, sure. So we, we schedule it for the next day, that Thursday. But I'm trying so hard not to laugh when he's yelling, because even yeah. though he said, even though he was 75 at the time, he still talked like he was 20. So I'm, I'm expecting him to say, I'm not going to be a pawn in your game, Joker. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> and, then the, and then we did the next day. It wasn't anything super special. He just was talking about the dog food company him and his wife had. They have like an organic dog food company. And he was rehashing all the Batman stuff. I wanted to ask him about the exploitation movies he made in the 80s and 90s. And we were running low on time because I had another interview that kept getting rescheduled. You know, I could have talked to him for easily another 10 minutes, but I, I had to go, you know, but it was good overall. At least I got it. Yes, wow. that's great. Congratulations on that. Who are some yeah. of the others that you just, you were like, you can't believe you got the interview and the interview went so well. Well, God, there's many of those. Um, I mean, I've talked about my Gina Shock interview, uh, the drummer for the Go Go's. That one is is very special to me because I got her to be vulnerable in ways that I had never heard her be vulnerable before, and she was feeding off my energy. She could tell I was a real fan and stuff. And I, I see, I saw her do all these interviews uh, for her book around that time and stuff. She's just phoning it in, answering the same questions she's answered a million times. But I don't know. She got it pretty heavy with me. I cut. I cut, she had me cut some stuff out that she didn't want uh, uh, broadcasted, and they, they were pretty good stories. You know, that one definitely. You know, and then I had her come back on uh, last summer, and we were both really silly because we were tired because we had done other interviews earlier that day and stuff. Yeah, I'd like to get her on a third time. She's been very low key lately. She's been doing a lot of autograph shows and stuff, but I know that she hasn't been doing too many interviews. I got to find out what that's about, but <clears throat> Gina shock. Yeah. It was a special one. Uh, Blake Edwards, daughter, Jennifer has been on twice. She feeds off my energy because she could tell I'm a true fan of her dad's, uh, all the movies that he did, the Pink Panther movies and Experiment and Terror and 10 and so many others. And I have really great interviews with her. And, you know, Blake Edwards, uh, he showed later on in his career just how sick his sense of humor could be. He did a lot more R-rated movies, right? It's awesome that he uh, raised his daughter not to be easily offended because she's got a, a great sense of humor and stuff. And, that was a great that that was a great one, especially the first one. 
And let's see, I interviewed the porn star Ginger Lynn. That was interesting because for 25 minutes, we're talking about how, you know, back in the day, they didn't use condoms on porn sets like they do nowadays. Not all of them do, but a lot of them do now. And we're just talking very philosophical about it. Then I bring up the B movies that she, that she starred in. Um, she made the Vice, Acad the Vice Academy movies and the director, I won't say his name, he's been on my show. He's a, he's a strange guy. And I could tell she didn't want to talk about him because it's well known that she had a falling out with him. So she tried to end the interview by mentioning her art. And then I interjected and I said, how did you get cast in Young Guns 2? Because that was the only mainstream movie on her, on her IMDb because it's all exploitation films. And she says to me, how many followers do you have? And I made up a, a number. And she said to me, she blew the producer and that's how she got the role. And I'm thinking in my mind that maybe because she dated Charlie Sheen, maybe there was a connection there, but no, she gave head to the producer and that's how she got cast. Now I thought during this interview that it was a fun, it was a fun blow job, but apparently it was a me too story because I heard her tell it on another show recently and she made it sound more me too. Like I was like, wow, this is, this is interesting. And then she told me <laughs> Then she told me Sam Kinison's story. She was very close with Sam Kinison. And her stories were actually very humanistic because you, you hear about what a bully Sam was and all the awful things he did and stuff. These ones were actually good ones. I, I, I really liked how she portrayed Sam, you know, as, as, a, as a good guy when, when he wanted to be, you know? <laughs> those, were, those were good. Those were good stories. Yeah, we have Stephen Pearl here in uh, Vegas, and yeah. I hear some some of them Sam Kinison stories once in a while. Steve says, <laughs> Sam, Sam Kinison, yeah, yeah, brilliant. Two short screams followed by a long scream. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen <Yeah>. Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think who else. Yeah, I just I've been so lucky, and I've done interviews where I was looking forward to it, and I don't I don't know I just didn't have the right energy, or they didn't have the right energy, and I feel like I'm rehashing stuff that they've talked about too often. I didn't give anything new to it. I've had a lot of those kind of interviews too, you know, with certain people. I just interviewed Bruce Davison the other day, who's one of my favorite character actors of all time the nicest guy i met him in person years ago at a convention and it was good but i just didn't feel like um, I, I really added anything new uh, that he hasn't talked about before but he was very he was very kind of decent you know we had some laughs there and stuff uh, he, he did that he did the uh, the chevy chase of dan Aykroyd movie spies like us i, I was i was hoping he was going to give examples to to their personality of dan Aykroyd being the nice guy and chevy being the cocky jerk you know but he didn't give any examples but he did describe chevy chase as like a, a labrador dog <laughs> <laughs> did tommy chong give you an interview yes that was a that was a, a fabulous one because for one week i was considered cool in my own town <laughs> you know and he, I, I asked maybe four questions because he gave me these long stories and answers that I didn't expect. You know, got getting into a fist fight with John Sebastian and all this stuff. And I was just like, oh, my God, he's taking me places I didn't expect. You know, I told him my um, my edible experience I had years ago. My friend Anna Murray and I, we've been friends since high school and we know each other very well. And there's like no boundaries with us. Nothing's off limits. And one time we were going to go have dinner at this Chinese restaurant with her best friend, Adrian, who also went to high school with us. And this guy who was possibly a romantic suitor for Adrian. I liked him. He made me laugh, but apparently he was a real asshole. So she kicked him to the curve later. But we're going to go um, have Chinese dinner with them, right? And she gives me an edible cookie and she says, Eat that. I'm like, Why? And she's like, Just do it. So I eat it. It tasted really nasty, but pretty soon the buzz kicked in real fast. And she starts laughing at me. She's like, I got you. I got you high before this. And next thing you know, 
I'm trying to motorboat her while she's driving. <laughs> and and she and she's just like nudging me back and everything. I was like, hey, you did this. You put me on any stimulants, I'm gonna start doing shit like that, by the way. I don't advise anybody to get me on stimulants at all. <laughs> I, I'm warning you. So then, you know, uh we, we, we park in an alleyway. She's wearing her work clothes. She takes her work clothes off and puts on her um, her, her her dinner clothes and stuff and you know I'm just super high and I'm like you know hey let's have a quickie and she's like no we're not gonna have a quickie here in this alleyway <laughs> and, <so, laughs> and then we then we go to have that dinner you know and the guy's making jokes he's like saying to the waiter hey you got milk here <laughs> <Stuff like that. laughs> and that was my edible experience <laughs> oh my goodness so who would you consider to be the hardest interview that you had to get that was the most rewarding or have you already covered that? There's a, uh, there's probably a lot of them. I mean, today, for instance, I did an interview with uh, Julie Pikarski who played Sue Ann on the facts of life in the first season. And as soon as we're done, I'm going to go edit that and, and upload it. She, she was, she was a, a little hard to get. Um, I remember I, I tried to get her on Facebook um, earlier this year. And then I, I, then I went to Instagram and um, I, we made contact in April, but she had a lot going on. She was uh, visiting her kids. She was doing a movie, lots of stuff. And she even acknowledged it at the end of the interview. She's like, I'm so sorry. I had to make you wait and stuff, but I had to get everything done in order to get this done to, in order for us to get this done today. And I'm glad I did it. We had a, a, a ball. So that oh, was a rewarding one today. Yeah. That's fabulous. Congratulations on that. Yeah. <laughs> Who made your life a miserable, holy hell trying to get them on? I've got a story, <laughs> but I can't say their name. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot of those and stuff. Um, who made my life miserable to, to get on? There's, God, there's some people. It <laughs> took uh, quite a few years. It's been happening lately. People I, I reached out to six, seven years ago when I started that are finally doing it now. And it, it's great. And, and, and uh, God, I'm trying to think. I wish I was prepared for that one. because That's a all lot right. Of them. I just yeah. want to hear, I want to hear all, all your stories, any which way that you want to slice it. I'll tell you about the worst interview I ever did. Nick, Nicholas Meyer, who directed Star Trek two and six, he was, and I'm, I'm so glad I found out I'm not alone in this. He's just arrogant, volatile, bitter. He cares more about his Sherlock Holmes books than he does uh, the Star Trek fans and, fans of his movies and stuff you know it's, the interview started off good he called me tom and we were off to the races and then as the half hour wore on he just got defensive and arrogant and volatile and he he he, he said are we gonna talk about my book now you know and, and i learned a valuable lesson talk about the book first or the new project first when they really want to push it I've, I've done that ever since and we did, you know, and yeah, that was not one of my favorites, you know, and I've heard him do it to other people. I've heard he's been hiding it lately, though, like whenever he does an interview, he when they're on Zoom, he starts off by saying, you know, I'm only doing this because I'm doing you a favor. He, he gets the volatility out of the way and then he, he acts all professional and nice now. But for a while there, he was going full throttle with the arrogance. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah, I didn't like that one. Have you ever interviewed somebody when they're like severely depressed and like they openly admit it and how'd that go? Uh, not someone who's openly admitted it, but I've heard it, um, especially during the pandemic. There was this one guy, he was a founding member of the Groundlings. Um, I was expecting this to be an hour interview. I was expecting him to be as funny as he was on Gilbert Gottfried's podcast he has a funny story about accidentally seeing Gary Morton's dick when he was going swimming with Lucy and um, Gary Morton. But he 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 didn't give me a good interview. He sounded very depressed. I'm sure he lost family members or something, and I'm sure he was affected by the pandemic. I was really, really disappointed by that interview. And yet he's very supportive of me on social media, which is kind of bizarre, you know. But, yeah. It was that, that was an interesting one. And then I remember I talked to another improv guy. I'm like, comedians are stand up comedians are supposed to be depressed, not improv guys. Like, what the hell's going on here? Another another improv guy was depressed, you know. 
but yeah, they've I've never heard them actually admit admit to it, you know. Yes. I, I personally I went, I went to interview Rich Voss during the pandemic mm -hmm. and he was like, I don't want to do this. I all my people are waiting. And yeah. he's so I got him on and he would not answer any questions. He just kept roasting how stupid my questions were. And then he decided uh, to interview me. And so like uh, I have an interview yeah. where he interviews me. <laughs> I've got I've gotten a lot, a lot, especially early on. I don't get them as much anymore, but early on, I, I was still learning how to be a good interviewer. There would pe be people that asked me questions, um, especially in the the first couple of years. And I was very open then. Now I've I've kind of uh, scaled back a little bit now that my followership has grown and I get a lot of weirdos contacting me every so often i've been very selective with what i talk about and stuff but now i've owned my skills as an interviewer i don't really have the guest interviewing me anymore but it's always the same demeaning questions you know why do you do this um you you know how many followers do you have which is a hint for how much how how much money can you pay me for this or can i trust you you know those are demeaning questions you know i just i don't, I don't know what the heck goes through these people's minds you know exactly exactly i i uh i get tired of the egos like if you're gonna play the yeah. egomania game before the interview i'm out i'm not yeah. into yeah. egos yeah oh yeah I, I don't put up with that shit being half italian and half irish i don't <laughs> I, I i let them know who's boss right away you know and i say you know you're my you're my guest. This is my show, you know. And you know, if I was on your show, I would have to abide by your rules, and I would gladly do it if you were nice to me, you know. But you're being a, a dick right now. <laughs> Good for you. That's the way to do it. So, yeah. what's the shortest interview and why? And what was the longest interview and why? There were interviews that were short early on when I started because. I, I became so exhausted because I'm trying to get information out and I'm, and I wasn't good that I ended them. They were like 15 to 20 minutes long in the early years. Right. Some of the people actually came back later when I was a better interviewer and I did longer interviews with them, but I'm trying to remember the last short interview that I can recall right now, back in 2020, I interviewed this actor. He was in a couple of, um, popular horror movies in the 80s and he's got like a hundred other credits since and you know the horror fans don't realize that he had been working that much with over a hundred credits right and i guess he thought that i was going to be one of those guys right so he gave me very short answers on the horror stuff and then i started asking him about other things that he did and then he opened up and while he's doing this, he's multitasking in his office, like moving office stuff, right? Which I hate. I hate it when a guest is driving during an interview. Um, I, I had that situation this summer, and she told me not to release it because the sound was so shitty. And I'm like, well, you did it, you know, and I won't release it because I'm embarrassed, quite frankly. But this guy was doing multitasking in his office, right? And then at about 19 minutes, he's he, he's he's like saying, "Well, I gotta go now," you know. And it's the day before Thanksgiving, so that was probably the last real short interview that I did. Got it. So, what's some of the biggest mistakes you made where you learned the most? I want to hear some of the tragedies of doing interviewing from your point of view. It's funny, if you ask anybody if they're bitter, they get really, really testy with you because it's obvious that they are. There was quite a few people in the early years that uh, would get testy with me, you know, when I said that, including one person I just talked to unrecorded that I was trying to get an interview with. I didn't end up interviewing this person. I was like, I was like, don't be bitter. And she's like, I'm not bitter. It's just, I work for Disney now. I can't talk about those, those naked comedies I did back in the eighties and stuff. And it's just like, Oh God, <laughs> Oh brother. You know, asking, you know, people if they're bitter and stuff like that, you know, um, you know, I tell dirty jokes at the end of uh, my interviews with the ladies, you know, and there were there were a couple ladies that were offended and I edited them out later and stuff. I, I, I learned to read the room. Uh, over the phone you know I, I talked about that last time I remember you just got to see the person's energy if they're reserved or they're open and they're fun 
and you know the kind of projects that they did you know were they an r-rated project did you work with this comedian when when you when you do interviews like that and you're reading the room that way that those are the those are the best cues to tell dirty jokes to to uh, the, the female guests absolutely what's your favorite joke to tell to a lady oh god there's so many there's um <laughs> Let's see, you know, you know the difference between a golf ball and a G spot. It takes a man 20 minutes to find a golf ball. There's that joke, you know, there's, you know, um, there's uh, this one joke. There's a female comedian that I'm friends with. You should get her on your show. She is hilarious. Her name is Meredith Godfrey. She told me this joke, and I'm very selective with who I tell this joke to because this could offend a lot of people. I, you know, how do you make your wife scream twice? You fuck her in the ass and then you wipe your dick on the curtain. She told me that joke. Yeah, and I've, and I've told it to a few. I'm, again, I'm very selective with that <laughs> one. Oh my goodness. Did you ever read The Room Wrong um, later on in your career of podcasting? Like you thought because of their background that they would be cool, but when you told it, they got offended anyway? Yeah, there's a, a, a woman, she started to get a bad reputation um, amongst the horror community. She was in a horror movie. Her father was a comedy writer back in like the 50s and 60s in Hollywood. You would, you would think that she would have a great sense of humor. She acts like she's high all the time, and I think she is, and she doesn't really laugh much, you know, but she's very engaging. And I remember, but I did two interviews with her. I've, I should have only did done one, quite frankly. On the second one, I told her some jokes. I can't remember which ones. And she pulled a covert narcissist trick by uh, telling uh, a mutual friend that um, that I offended her and stuff. It's like, your dad was a comedy writer. Did you hate your dad? I mean, she doesn't really talk about him that much. So maybe she did. Who knows? And she just doesn't like comedy. Who knows? You know, that disappointed me. Wow. Man, if you're offended, tell the person for crying out loud. Oh, yeah. There's, there's been people who have, but like, yeah, like I said, the covert narcissist trick, you know, that's what they do. They they act like that they're not offended, but yet they are, you know, and they'll they'll try to screw you over big time behind your back. Yeah. Wait, so you like people that you've had on when you were first doing interviews and you weren't that great at it because you were new. When mm -hmm. you go back to them, do you tell them, look, I've gotten so much better. You got to come back on and see this. If I if I got an energy sense that uh, um, that they didn't want to come back because they haven't replied my message, that's when I do that. But other than that, no, I mean, I mean, thank God I have a good personality because they did want to come back, you know, and plus they do so many interviews, you know, they probably forgot which one was the bad one sometimes with who did it. So. Yeah, I'm just lucky that way. Those are great tips for me. Oh, my gosh. My first interview that I regret was Kathy Ladman. I love I, Kathy. I first, I've had her on. When I first started, I was using my phone to take a picture of my computer screen. So it was a picture mm -hmm. of a picture. It was like LinkedIn twice removed. It was horrible audio, horrible video. She gave me five minutes and I have been eating dirt about that. I just want to go back to her and say, oh my God, that was so horrible. I'm sorry. Would you come back? I'm not bragging. I did a full hour with her. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Absolutely. Wait. When she did her interview on Mark Marin last year, I was so proud of her. Like I was posting it, you know, going her. her said yeah, just five years ago you were on the full mark you know I was just so happy about that yes absolutely you know, I think I could handle I hope she over... forgives you what's that I hope she forgives I hope she forgives you and gives you an encore because you deserve it how sweet are you I would love an encore with her I would love that I think I would know how to handle myself this time yeah and my social media but yeah so what what is the biggest thing that you have learned that you want to drop knowledge for young podcasters out there? Pe people with shows, podcasts, do's and don'ts. What rises to the surface in Tommy Throwback Coex Co Mind? <laughs> do's. You know, 
go after subjects that you're passionate about because people can tell when you're not, you know, and I, I've been, I'm so passionate about pop culture that, you know, it evolved from just being a horror and sci-fi show to a, to a pop culture show, you know, and people, I think that's another reason why I'm successful because people know that I'm passionate about it and that I have all this knowledge, you know, just be knowledgeable about something you're passionate about and go after it that way. Um, you know, you don't always have to go through the management teams and everything. You can DM people or email people, you know, and just tell them, you know, straightforwardly, you know, you love their work and that you're passionate about it and you just want to talk about this and that and that you won't go near this and all of that stuff. It's it's simple, you know, and the don'ts, you know, I can't really think of too many do don'ts, you know, other than, you know, if you want to tell dirty jokes, read the room, you know. <laughs> That's about <laughs> it. <laughs> oh my goodness sakes. So what else would you like to talk about? Any other favorite interviews, people that you've gotten to know off camera because of being on camera? Anything? I mean, yeah, I mean, there's people that I've interviewed and I've and I've hung out with them when I was in LA uh, before the pandemic and stuff. Terry Bolo, she is a founding member of the Groundlings and she was in the she had all these small parts in movies like Pee Wee's Big Adventure and Carrie and Big Wednesday. And she's a, a, a little tiny woman. She did stand in work for children on sitcoms. I mean, that's how tiny she is. She is a tiny person with a big, gigantic heart of gold. She's been my biggest supporter. She tells everybody about me all the time, you know, and she's like my aunt and I'm like her nephew and we've become close. And our our, our unrecorded conversations are, are are just as funny and interesting as our recorded ones. <laughs> and so, I'd like and, to be a fly on the wall for that one. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, if you want to do uh, an interview about improv comedy, especially at that time, you know, you should reach out to her and you're both in the same age group. You know, I think you two would get along great. How do you, you know. spell her last name? B-O-L-O. -O, Bolo. What I thought. Yes. There's a picture of her, a uh, picture of Tinkerbell in the um, profile picture. She loves Tinkerbell. And I've interviewed um, the model for Tinkerbell, Margaret Carey. Oh, that's oh, she's got a funny story. She did this bad noir movie called Cannon City in 1948 with um, Scott Brady, who did that Western show, uh, Shotgun Slade, and he was the sheriff in Gremlins, uh, Dr. McCoy on Star Trek, the Forrest Kelly, and Jeff Corey, the uh, acting teacher. There are three guys who escape from jail. They hide out. They terrorize this old couple um, uh, stealing their house, pretty much. And Margaret Carey is the love interest. She was like 18, 19 years old when she did this. And I think a moose's head on the wall fell on top of her, right? <laughs> it, it hurt, but she was like, I'm okay. I'm okay. So she goes back uh, to do the next take, and blood starts emerging from her head. She had a hemorrhage and didn't even know it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was like coming like 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 uh, like uh, behind the ears and stuff. It was embarrassing. <laughs> she said she was eighteen or nineteen years old. Oh my yeah. goodness sakes! One time I was doing an interview in Portland, Oregon, mm. and the, my co my co interviewee she would come drunk and high, and she would mm. meet to the men, and. <sighs> the club wanted us to do interviews, but she was messing them all up. And I, it was so much pressure. It's like, I would be doing serious interview questions and she was just, and so one day I decided Tommy to give it mm -hmm. to her and let her see what it's like. So I, I wasn't drunk. I wasn't high. I was doing it sober. I was just, uh, uh, we had on uh, this one guy and I was just <laughs> me too and him left and right. He was like, three times younger than me you know he's like barely 20 and I was just me too and him and she was just like what are you doing uh, yeah You're stealing you from me <laughs> and then yeah. while I was doing that I felt this thing on my arm I felt a ping yeah. I looked down I had a golf ball sized blood clot that a vein ruptured from all the pressure <laughs> I was like I wow. am so done with her <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I would be too. <laughs> I was like, well, when you feel a ping on your arm, folks, take a look. You might need to have attention to it real quick. 
It sounds like you two could have been a comedy team. <laughs> <laughs> she was really funny, but, you know, she just couldn't control her substances and the interview process at the same time. There's, you know, like one or the other, not both at the same time. <laughs> the Have you ever done team. interviews with anybody else, Tommy, or just solo? Uh, just me. I, I had someone uh, approach me recently about coming on because uh, I was going to be interviewing her friend. And I was just like... Um, I, <sighs> First off, you you both both of you have reputations for talking a lot, so I probably wouldn't get a word in edgewise or, or ask questions. So I could handle one one chatterbox at a time. And she's like, "Okay, fine." You know, <laughs> um, there was a there was a trend going on during the pandemic where a lot of horror and nostalgic podcasts were getting a female assistant with a very annoying squeaky voice. And I'm glad I, I didn't know too many of uh, that because I probably would have been tempted to do it. But I have interviewed a lot of women with squeaky high voices and they're always the sharpest ones. They got the most intelligent minds and they're the funniest. Like Joyce Bullifant from the Mary Tyler Moore show. I interviewed her. She was another interview I loved. She was just making me laugh with that high voice the entire time. You know, and she didn't think too highly of Ed Asner, she told me. And I interviewed him like a few months later and stuff, which was an, an interesting one, too. I told his publicist, you know, um, get get him on the landline because it's a better sound. Well, there was some confusion in the house. And so he had to do it on his cell phone. I'm like, damn it. And the, the, the sound on his end was not too good. But we we had a, an interesting little half hour chat there. And he made a joke at the end at Asner. I said to him, do you have any upcoming projects? And he said, you don't know her. And then next thing you know, publicist starts laughing hysterically. And Ed starts laughing hysterically. And that joke went over my head. I was like, guys, can you explain this to me? And they're laughing. And Ed's like, I like this kid. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. Who's yeah. somebody you want to still interview? Or who, who are a couple on your... You said Judy Carter. I can make that connection for you. Oh, uh, that would be great. Yeah. Um, I would still like to get Carney Wilson. You know, I finally got Ileana Douglas on back in January. Um, the sound was a little shitty on her end. I was calling from Connecticut. And that was a good talk. And we, we got to talk about classic films and stuff. And she was great. Yeah, but like Carney Wilson, um, I still try to get Valerie Valerie Landsberg from Fame. She's like a must on my list, but she's been super busy. She's been promising me for like a, for like oh, two years now, not even a, yeah two years that I'd like, and you know people like that. Got it. Got it. Well, what would you like to say to people that are watching this at this time or in the future? Hardly anybody watches at the time on my thing, but people that are watching, whether they're comedy enthusiasts, podcast, uh, you know, voyeurs, or just regular people, what would you like to say to people that are watching this? Just, you know, check out, check out Splat from the Past. You know, it's audio only, black screen. We have very fun, candid conversations about my passion, you know, and they lead me down rabbit holes eventually that are just hilarious and very insightful. And I, I enjoy doing them, you know, and I got some real good ones coming up. I got uh, Karen Duffy. She was a um, MTV VJ back in the day. And then she was one of the villains in Dumb and Dumber. I got her coming on. She's like an advocate for people who have... Um, like like chronic pain and stuff because she suffers from a, like a rare chronic pain disease that she's had for like 30 years it sidelined her career sadly um i got former child actor moosey dryer coming on man he worked with a lot of comedy legends when he was a kid he worked with tim conway uh carol burnett uh, he was on laughing where he was like he was always like the random kid in the sketch you know whenever they needed like an eight-year-old you know to be in the sketch he was he was doing that you know, I got that one coming up. I got a lot of obscure people you probably never heard of, but, you know, it's going to be a fun conversation. I love that. Thank you so much, Tommy. Tommy, throwback, yeah. Kovac. Yes, follow him. Splat from the Past is the name of his podcast. And follow yeah. him on Facebook, Tommy Kovac. All of his links are in the <laughs> chat, right, Tommy? Are, yes, um, I'm on Facebook. 
Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, yeah, my YouTube channel is just Tommy Kovac. It's just the picture of me with, with Freddy Krueger at a convention. And I'm posting, you know, almost daily, weekly, and all that stuff. And to answer that question uh, you asked in the beginning, I I, I prefer either Indies or Audis on, 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 on girls, you know, and stuff. Why don't, you, why, don't you, why don't you show us yours, Linda? Because I showed you mine last time. <laughs> <laughs> mine is so big on camera. It looks even bigger. You might get it confused for my hoochie, so I don't want to go there. <laughs> Take a few steps back. <laughs> <laughs> zoom in, zoom out. <laughs> 3D coming at you. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much, Tommy. Yes. Always, Linda. Love you. Love you right Mwah. back. Mwah. Tommy Kovac. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.